I'm Robert Cohen, and this is Penn Presents Rocky Mountain Writers. Our guest today is Margot Weiss, the author of Extinction, A Story of Our Future, a uh, work of fiction and very apocalyptic, I may say, if I may say so, and I think I say so. Uh, essentially, it's about the end of human life on Earth. Now, uh, I've gone through the book. Uh, I found it to be a very interesting concept because it raises a great many issues that we're faced with. And I think that uh, what's most interesting to me is who you are and how you came to write this particular kind of book, because it's not a very pleasant topic. Hmm. So let's, let's start with you. Um, are you a writer? Is this your first book, your last book? Uh, um, this is the first published book. I have a number of books that I'm writing. I did not expect to be writing fiction although I have a couple of other fiction books that I am involved in writing. Mostly I would think my work would be more involved in nonfiction um, uh, and art and philosophy, which are the areas more of my expertise and interest. Um, but I'm very much a writer, and the idea for this came out of my own personal dilemma, which I think is the dilemma of our modern times of what, what can we do given what we know about what human beings are currently involved in, what the history of the human race has been, and the pace of technology and the consequences of our technology. Um, you have a background in writing? You studied writing or what? Um, I studied writing. I've done business writing. I've, I've been involved in writing for many years. And here locally or, or other parts of the country? In other parts of the country. I was in the Los Angeles area for a number of years before I came to Colorado about 15 years ago. And uh, the idea here in your book Extinction, A Story of Our Future, is that as a result of technology, in this case a direct broadcast satellite system which is up at 30 gigahertz, a very high frequency, I believe they're now broadcasting at 12 gigahertz or something mm -hmm. like that, that this causes infertility causes a breakdown in a certain gene right. in the human uh, genomes uh, which makes it impossible for uh, almost everyone to have children and suddenly we have a world population with no more children being born. Yeah. Uh, that's a very drastic concept. Uh, uh, do you have a, any kind of a background in uh, sciences? I mean, why choose this, this means of extinguishing the human race? Um, what I the idea was to find an element that could actually work to explore an actual extinction of the, of the human race, which at this point, given the numbers of human beings that there are, there are very few things that we can actually do or that can actually happen that, will, that would suddenly involve the extermination of all human beings. There's almost nothing that we can really do, although um, apocalyptic thinking is very popular right now many of the things that we conceive of wouldn't really do that. Um, the idea of, of the possibility of infertility is not that I conceive of that as being a probability or even a possibility, but it gave a way to look at the implications of some of the things that we're doing on a smaller scale. Well, let's say uh, you, you deal with this topic of tobacco, the cigarette uh -huh. industry, uh, which uh, according to latest statistics, I believe something like uh, four to five hundred thousand people die uh, each year uh, in the United States alone as a result of uh, cigarette use mm -hmm. and worldwide maybe twice as many or more uh, which means that in the last ten years probably uh, five million Americans have died as a result of emphysema, of, uh, heart attacks, whatever uh, the results are. So you've kind of carried this to its uh, logical conclusion, i.e. that we, if our technology is capable of doing this today, and, and it's so difficult for us to stop it, uh, even though uh, it's been known by the cigarette companies, as it's come out, that they, they knew more than 30 years ago uh, what their product was doing. So your concept is that we might be doing things to ourselves with microwaves in the near future that could really kill everybody off. But, but why choose this as a topic? What, is this a personal thing on your part? Do you think, are you a doomsday thinker? Absolutely not. And a lot of what extinction is about is actually looking at the universal values and ideals of humankind and, and how 
our destructive side lives side by side with our constructive side. Um, what I see in terms of, you know, why would I want to explore that idea of extinction? We have a very limited, hum as humans, we have a very um, limited focus. We see ourselves as being the superior creatures on the planet when in all truth, uh, bacteria have ruled the planet since the beginning of life until today. And there's a certain arrogance and limitation in our focus in terms of time, what human beings have, um, you know, plastered across the planet has only really happened within the past 200 to 2,000 years. It's a very minuscule period of time. So that the concept of extinction is something that's very basic to life forms on the planet. Um, extinction is something that happens, but we tend to think that that's not possible to have happen to us. Um, and it is. It is. But why, why, why does this interest you enough to write a book about it? Have, have, have you thought about this for years? Has this just suddenly come to you? or Where does the idea to write a book about the extinction of the human race come from? And you, you personally. When did you first start thinking about this? Are you, have you been involved in the environmental movement, the ecologist? Or um, obviously, from many of the themes in the book, it's very much environmental and ecologically conceived. Um, in terms of looking at what we're doing as like, in a global effect on the planet, with very little conscious awareness of what we're doing, or um, there's no consolidation. We've, we've, it's escaped us that this is a global community. This is something that's just in the past 30, 40 years with the, with the shots of you know, being able to see the Earth from space and really understand this truly is one planet. We really are one family of human beings and we're very dependent upon the Earth's cycle. What, I've, what we can all observe and is so, um, is so disturbing is how we, so much of our actions have become connected to e economics, politics, and self-interest. So there's, um, there's not a perspective of what is the meaning of life, what does it mean to be alive as a human being in the universe, and what what are the implications to the entire planet? And certainly we can all look around and say there are many very disturbing things that are happening. There's an incredible inequity of wealth so that we live in a world of comfort and security and you know there's 99% of the world that would do anything to be where you and I are sitting today. And yet we live in oblivion to that. So that so much that we're doing, the same thing that's happening with technology, there's this pressure to create, to find new solutions to things, and yet, without looking at what all the implications are, what are the implications to the ecology, what are the implications to our mental health, what are the implications to our history, to the generations, it's, we, we keep operating in very limited time frames and very limited concepts. So it's the, con it's the contradiction between, let's say, short-term and long-term self-interest. It's certainly in the long-term mm. self-interest of humanity to continue to exist and not to poison ourselves. That's certainly true. But from a short-term point of view, an individual who's trying to make money or a company or a corporation or a group, a conglomerate, uh, you feel that the, we do things product-wise and environmentally. Uh, well, I think a good example is the whole business with the atomic energy program. Uh, we've created a, a, some kind of a monster. We don't know what to do with the waste. Right. Yeah. And this is one of the, the explorations in extinction. It doesn't point that, it's not pointing at technology saying, you know, the people that are promoting technologies are evil and are trying to destroy. And this isn't true. What's true is that the motivation, the economic motivations have become what creates um, movement, invention, distribution, all of 
all of how we are making decisions at this point is based on economics. Um, there's a line in the book where it's, it's called a, a, a tyrant. A despotic tyrant is another way for we, what, we can, what we describe as economics. Because common sense, virtue, um, depth of feeling is no longer valued or conceived of. So that the technology in itself isn't bad. It's, it's just blind. So, and what it blinds us to is the idea that our human created world is supreme. This is very far from the truth. Well, and I, it's I, a delusion that's extremely dangerous. We see, we see phenomena today of such things, I believe, as frogs being born, uh, orange and white frogs. Absolutely. Perhaps because of estrogens uh, being in the sewage and things like that. Uh, I, even, I don't think your book is that far-fetched. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, somebody might say, well, 30 gigahertz microwave is not going to uh, crack uh, chromosomes, at, uh, but I think it's allegorical. That is to say, there are other things which are affecting us. Uh, Absolutely. Breast cancer among women, prostate cancer among men. There are many, many factors, and I think that your book brings that idea uh, and what it means to people. And it brings out the, the idea that it's very hard to figure out what these causes are, because we can't isolate them, because I mean, uh, the company that, that promotes this satellite transmission does its very best to research its safety, just as many organizations do. No one's intentionally wanting to cause genetic mutations in frogs or people or anyone. But these things are happening, and we don't know their causes, and we don't know how to even separate the strands that are weaving together a destructive force. What can we do about it? I mean. You pose a problem, and the problem is a very current problem, and it's getting more and more severe. But do you have any ideas about possible solutions? Well, one of the, um, the central section of the book, which is called The Core, is part of a solution in that, which what it focuses on is a global non-organization of an imagine, imaginary organization. An imaginary organization. Um, it's, it's, again, you know, much of this book is very close to realism, so that the core concept, which is basically a, a, a global um, coming together, gathering together, of people who are genuinely wise, virtuous, and um, operating from the interests of all of humanity, all of life, and the planet itself. Now, that may seem very idealistic. You know, idealism has become so unpopular in this day and of cynicism. But there are people like that. And you and I could sit here and, and name four or five very well-known people whose characters are impeccable in terms of, of these type of qualifications. And at this time in history, we have the ability for an international coming together. You know, Gandhi had a little segment of the world that he was able to affect. Martin Luther King, the same type of thing. In the global communication that we have in this era, uh, one of the possibilities, in addition to the degradation of our planet, is the possibility for people of such extraordinary leadership skills and the ability to motivate the universal ideals and the idealism of, of many people, many millions of people. These people can come together for the first time in history. And that's what happens in extinction, is there is a movement of these types of leaders who amass the resources of finance, which are absolutely necessary to be able to do anything in the world today. And um, in addition, all the resources, all the volunteers, all of that type, they, they begin to attract people who are involved in media, which is such a major way that history is being made. So that there are many ways for us to grapple with the problems that we have. One of my explorations in this book is to do that realistically. So we're not trying to fool ourselves. You know, there's many ways we're trying to fool ourselves right now. One is we're not in trouble. Another is somehow we'll figure it all out. Another is, you know, we'll meditate and it'll all go away and everybody will suddenly Based on what we can see of how things happen, none of these are realistic approaches. Well, just to interrupt for a moment, uh, we have global warming. Yeah. Uh, We've been debating it for 20 years. <laughs> that's right. And, and uh, uh, I was watching television uh, 
not too long ago, and uh, a leading uh, politician, prominent politician, I won't mention the party or so, but you can guess, uh, said, well, I was just down in Antarctica, and uh, they're, they're getting even more snow there or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see where it's global warming. Uh, obviously, if there's global warming, there's more evaporation from the seas, there's going to be more snow and more rain in different parts of the world. Uh, global warming doesn't mean everybody gets to live in the tropics. Right. And also, the, the hurricanes and other storms uh, are becoming more, much more severe. And the fascinating thing is that the insurance companies right. are beginning to get concerned because they've got to cover the damage from these terrible uh, typhoons, tornadoes, and things of that kind. And so let's hope that uh, enlightened self-interest will lead the commercial establishment to realize mm -hmm. that uh, catastrophe is not good for anybody, especially not good for insurance companies, and uh, maybe they can start uh, leaning a little bit on the people who are creating the situation, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the fossil fuel consumption and other things that are leading uh, the fluor uh, chlorofluorocarbons, I believe they're pronounced, mm -hmm. and other such things. So your, your book, uh, oh, I mean, it, it's kind of like Rachel Carson's uh, mm -hmm. what, Silent Spring, mm -hmm. uh, although it's a work of fiction, that's the feeling I get from reading it. And I, I assume that was your intention. It's a work of, about perspective. And yes, I, I do feel that that's my intention. I feel that um, we all, there are so many people that are well-educated, well-intentioned, good-hearted, well-informed, and yet we're floundering in a sense of either being overwhelmed or um, wanting to just hide from the whole. Because it, what can you do? You know, that we all, okay, so if we know all of this, what can we do? And each person ends up in this dilemma. Well, well now, uh, what can the individual do? Now, we've spoken about, let's say, insurance companies are responding, but do you have any uh, suggestions for people, for the person who reads your book and says, oh, yes, this is a possibility, or something like it, mm -hmm. what can they do about it? Um, I believe what each of us can do is begin to support those organizations, those leaders, and those gathering together that, um, that, are de that are focused on what I call core principles, the principles of, um, of humanity, of love for life, of reverence for the earth, of recogni realistic recognition of, of what needs to happen. There are many organizations, there are many people who are dedicated to this, and we can support them. Yeah, but the, I doubt if there are many people who disagree with that, but when it comes to a question of stepping on your own toes economically, you mm -hmm. know, should, should people in business limit their profits? Absolutely. And I want to make a point that one of the things that I've done, as, a, as my own personal statement about that in Extinction at the end of the book, the last statement is, 85% of my profits from this book will be dedicated to core principles. Because that is the type of demonstration that our economic forces need to begin to take. We need to take a stand to say, I have enough. I can guarantee you the lifestyle that I live, I know, is much better than more than three billion people on this planet. I don't need more. And it's time for us to begin to say that, to begin to feel that and demonstrate it and, and show a leadership with it. And I believe that, you know, there are many individuals, there's many corporations, there's lots of ways that in this country we can begin to demonstrate that. And simple movements like that, I mean, you can see, this would cause a revolution. An e this would be a re an economic revolution. Now, whether or not many people are willing to do that, no, I don't think many people are, but I believe a lot of people are ready. And I think as more and more we become aware of the true gravity of what we're looking at and where we are in history, more people will be moved to do that. Well, let's hope it's, they're moved to, to stop this tendency before it's too late. And that, that's the point that you make in Extinction, that uh, when this transmission starts and the, the, the subject is super virtual reality. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some super <laughs> virtual reality. But the, the idea that uh, in trying to give people something that they would like to have and that they're willing to pay for, 
it's possible to do something which will have a long-term effect, and in your uh, book situation, not a very long-term, only in, in one generation, effectively, mm -hmm. of uh, making people sterile, of making them incapable of having children. And uh, we have, I think, various examples, contemporary examples of these mm -hmm. things happening. Uh, the uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and other cancer forms, which are continuously going up since the end of World War II, are obviously environmentally induced in some way by some type of product or mm -hmm. products right. which are being put out. And yet, is it not unrealistic to expect people to say, well, look, uh, let's say Philip Marsh and the other tobacco companies, uh, if things get difficult in the United States for them and they're going to be regulated by the FDA, uh, maybe they'll say, well, we'll sell in other countries where we're not regulated. DDT has been banned in the United States since the 50s and yet DDT is still manufactured and sold and used in other countries. And we, in fact, import food from places where DDT is used, so therefore we're getting poison from it, the exact, not exactly the same, but we're still getting poison. So is it really realistic to hope that commercially that anyone can run a company and not be replaced by somebody else if they start to cut down the profits because of long-term considerations? Is, is this a realistic thing to anticipate? Yes. It is because people are beginning to do it. And although um, that's, it's a very different way of seeing things, and it, it, it turns everything upside down from how it's been going along, it is possible to do it that way. One of the questions and one of the juxtapositions in Extinction has to do with that concept of, of that yearning for the virtual reality. And then the, what, is, what is reality? What is reality? What is, the, what is that virtual reality to which we've become so addicted in this culture and with the technologies that we're searching for some level of stimulation and meaning in these two-dimensional um, electronic chip? Three-dimensional now. And, and then three-dimensional, where the question of what is, what is real reality? How rich is it to be alive? How rich is it to be on this planet? We're in the universe. It's for real. We are in outer space. This is, life is here. And the realizations of that level of experience can give us a completely different perspective about what we're doing, where some of those short-term economic needs become much less important. Well, do you think that there should be some type of uh, national or supranational authority to protect the human race against the, the kind of eventuality here? I think that, um, I know that globalism is a very controversial concept for some reason, which is almost remarkable. The truth is that we have become a planet of enough human beings with enough interconnections that it is time we can no longer um, ignore the fact that this is a global family and how we create some some organization to that or what type of you know one world order has an awful nasty ring to many people um, and yet how are we going to make decisions one of the problems that they run into an extinction is they finally have a global problem we have global problems right now global warming is a global problem who makes the decisions about what we're going to do about that Nobody knows. We don't have any global way to deal with these questions. We need to. But would it be through the United Nations? Well, you know, the United Nations has become so tainted, it's bankrupt. You know, in the book, what it, you know, it just casually describes, you know, that long ago disappeared. It probably will. The, the whole nationalism and favoritism and all of the politics that have gone into that have made that organization no longer competent. And it's so... It's the only one there is, though. It's the only one that exists. So, um, you know, in, in my hope, something like the core will happen, where there are enlightened leaders, people who are recognized universally as being wise, who come together and begin to say, this is what's important, these are decisions we need to make, this is what we need in order to be able to change things, and naturally there will be follow followership, because when there is true leadership like that, followership is natural. Well, I hope <laughs> for the sake of, of my children and their children mm -hmm. and everybody else's children that uh, 
we are able to get something like this going. Uh, uh, the extinction uh, by Margot Weiss uh, is a work of fiction. It's a work of apocalyptic fiction, uh, which predicts a future in which the human race is essentially ceases to exist, not by being killed with the, by atomic explosions or... Well, there's actually a little element of hope in it. There's a, yeah. there's a seed of, of process where it starts all over again, and we get a second chance in this book. And if, if there was such a second chance, if there was an uh, Creeria, is the, the nation mm -hmm. that you discuss here, in which those people who can have children get together, what would it be like in, in 25 words or less? Well, you, <laughs> but I want to make a point. What, what exists is not only those people, but the three various, um, the three um, cultures that have always existed. There's Creeria, which is a highly cultured, peaceful, um, civilization that is looking to develop humankind to its highest potential. That's what Creeria is. There's also a group of people who are the Kongians who descend from a certain faction that separated out that is a group of people with a grudge. They're a group of people who are born and cellularly programmed to despise the Creerians and go towards destroying them. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third group of people who are indigenous people who just happen not to have been zapped by the... Small group on an island. The there's a small group on the island and nothing ever changed since, you know, for the past <laughs> 50,000 years. And in a lot of ways, and, and I didn't want that to happen. This, you know, people always say when they write books <laughs> of fiction, sometimes these things just happen and you can't stop them. And I could not prevent that from happening. The book took over. The book took over. The human, <laughs> human nature took over. Well, I want to thank you very much, Margot Weiss, uh, for having come on our show. Uh, the book is Extinction, and the cover art is by you, yes, the painting, a uh, very evocative painting. And I'd like to thank you very much, and uh, I'm looking forward to your next book. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.